So I believe we are live here with Tony Urbanic, and this is the how to build a Paul Rogers style prefab tattoo machine. This is a special opportunity, although you will be able to watch the replay. So if you're catching this live, this is the first of eight seminars. This one is free and open to the public. So please let us know in the chat rooms that uh where you're beaming in from right. how this is working and then share it around a little bit and yeah so so tony will be going over uh, an introduction to tattoo machine building um including a lot of the safety things that are necessary tools uh, ingredients and if you've purchased the the seminar uh thank you very much we appreciate it uh, there's still time to get it and if you're again if you're watching this a year from now the replays will be well worth it again it's a, a series of of eight full seminars that you will build a, a, a tattoo machine right alongside uh tony so uh yeah i'm going to check here it looks like the facebook's are working um, we are, uh, want to thank Guy Aitchison in reinventing the tattoo because he's making this possible. And uh, we are going out on, on the Guy Aitchison Facebook. We're going out on uh, the, the YouTube channels, Hyperspace Studios uh, and Tattoo Now. And very soon, well, not very soon, uh, the best place to find all of this content is Reinventing the Tattoos mobile app. You could go to either of the app stores and check it out, uh, download it. Please give us a, a good review. Now's a perfect time while it's getting rolling. Send us your critiques directly, but uh, say the nice things in the review places. And then, um, yeah, you can also go to community.reinventingthetattoo.com. And yeah, well, please let us know uh, again, where you're beaming in from in the chat room, if you know anybody that is interested in building tattoo machines, give it a go or, or give them a share. Um, if you're a female tattoo machine builder, then definitely check out, uh, well, the course is to, to find the course as um, reinventingthetattoo.com slash build a tattoo machine. And there are some scholarships. We want to have more female tattoo machine builders represented. Last time we did a panel, uh, we realized uh, we, we want to work on that a little bit. So I'm going to uh, stop the screen share. And here's Tony. And uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, pop back in with your questions and comments from the chat rooms. And uh, yeah, go, go easy on them. <laughs> Morning, everybody. And welcome to the first episode in an eight part series of <clears throat> how to build a Paul Rogers style prefab tattoo machine. My name is Tony Urbanic. Um, I'd like to, th first and foremost, I'd like to thank um, Gabe and Guy Atchison for inviting me to do this seminar here on uh, reinventingthetattoo.com. I'm a member there. You should check it out. Anyways, again, my name is Tony Urbanic. Um, I'm a machine builder and tattoo artist from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I started tattooing around 1989, 1990 um, in Pittsburgh. Um, and this is where I first got introduced to machine building. <clears throat> At that time, there weren't many uh, manufacturers, well, there, there were underground manufacturers, but there weren't really many mainstream suppliers of tattoo machines. And um, I didn't have much income at that time. So in order to afford a machine, you had to buy it by kit. You could save a couple of dollars. So there was a little company called National Tattoo Supply that I managed to weasel my way into. And I bought a kit. Well, the kit, um, it, it doesn't come with directions. Let's just say this. So I, there, was, there was a long learning curve in the process of um, learning to build machines there. Um, and that's where I got my first taste. Fast forward 10 years ago of tattooing, um, I just decided that I wanted to start delving into building my own tools. And there's a lot of gratification in building your own tools, as you will see if you continue through this. Um, yeah, I, I started building machines about with, with things I would just find around. I started with nothing and just started building tools, knowledge, um, just a collection of, of information for my arsenal to continue forward. 
I, uh, as the years progressed, I built more machines. I, I dove into casting. I, dove, I, I delved into machining, fabrication, cutting, CAD, anything. I became obsessed with tattoo machine building. And uh, it just kind of blossomed from there. I came out with a good product, in my opinion. And uh, people will kind of attach themselves to it. I had a lot of great influences in the beginning. Uh, Mike Skyver, a, a great historian in the industry, taught me a lot about um, machines, fabrications, and their builders. Um, I've always been interested in the art end of it. I've always tattooed, but just something about machine building just took over my life. Like it became the main focus in my life, in my career of tattooing. So I put 150% into it for a long period of time. This quest of knowledge and information just consumed me. Um, I had the, the fortunate it was fortunate in my life that I met a man named Jerry Rieger. Jerry taught me a lot about the Rogers fabrication process through his seminars. Um, in between him and Mike and various other peoples, they, they, they hit me to a lot of information about Paul and techniques and um, other people throughout the years that taught me little bits and pieces of information. So that helped me develop like, a artistic language for the style of design and fabrication. Moving forward. Um, oh, sorry, real quick, as, uh, as you're uh, chatting about the story, it's awesome. I just want to uh, let you know that there's people in the chat room here. We've got uh, uh, Sarah says, hello, Tony, exclamation point. Uh, Elizabeth uh, is so excited. Um, there's a fair amount of people here on the, on the Facebooks. Uh, Aloha says Evelyn. Um, yeah, so just want to let you know that uh, it seems to be working. And oh, oh, here we go. Let's see. Clifford Skyver's on here. Uh, oh, since I got this PR for you. The... <laughs> hey, Mike. See, Anyhow, uh, yeah, just... I owe a lot to you know that you say Clifford Skyver. We know him as Mike Skyver, the raffle wizard. Um, it's. I'm blessed to have met this guy. He took me under his wing in, in the early 90s, and he's, he's taught me so much. I mean, he'll deny he did it. He always says, I open the door, you walk through it. That's his, that's his big quote to me. But he has no idea the impact he's had on my life, especially with machine building. Um, he didn't let many people, if any, photograph any of the machines in his museum, let alone take them home and take measurements of these things like the, 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 it was so sacred to me um, and it meant a lot to me and I owe him a lot for my career um, just to interject that to people you know it's, it's, I love Mike um, so yeah getting back to it I was actually in the process of the story where Mike Skyver had a museum it was called Personal Arts Tattoo Museum Sadly, a few years back, um, it was lost due to a fire. Uh, it was a great loss to our community. And uh, but I was fortunate enough to experience it, photograph it, spend time there, a lot of time there. I would he was about an hour and 15 minutes away. I would drive there all the time and he would let me handle these machines. And what I learned getting back to the seminar was that. Machines, I, I had this conception of tattoo machines of just being either CNC'd or cast at that point in my career. And Mike exposed me to the, the handmade aspect. The, uh, like, it's like a gritty aspect. And, and, and it, inter it was intertwined with like nostalgia, antique. Like there was this, you could just, he collected all the history in that museum. So you, you could see how it intertwined machines intertwined in the eras, the twenties, the thirties, the forties, the fifties, sixties, seventies. And you could see how these machines were fabricated by hand, by crafters, by artists in their own style, in their own techniques. And again, I was intrigued by Paul. There was a lot of great builders in that museum. Um, there, there was Jerry machines, Zeiss, 
um, the Rogers um, spider webs. Spider web had a case. Well, you had a Mike had a machine case filled with spider web machines, and, and it was just stuff. I mean, that's the only word I could use is stuff that he found and just slapped on these machines, either welded, brazed, tigged, just it, it, just so ornate pieces of art. If you look up spider web tattoo machines online, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> it, it, to me, these bits and pieces helped me develop my craft. It, it, there were tools in my arsenal to be able to do what I do now. And, it, it, you know, just being an artist, you always want to move forward and strive to be better and learn more. So I adopted a lot of these practices and principles in my building and uh, not to drone on about myself and my history and my career or whatnot, but that, that, those were my beginnings. And I was fortunate enough to acquire designs, Paul Rogers machines for prefab. Now, getting to, to the terminology of prefab, prefabrication is we take each part of the tattoo machine and manufacture it. Now, the core of this seminar is how we can do this on a primitive level. I don't know if any of you have experience with the machines that I've built, not my productions, but my handmaids. They're really, I call them gritty, grimy, raw, antique, patina, steampunk, just crusty is the word I would use. I build crusty machines. You, you, you got one of them there, right? I have a lot of them right here. Yeah, um, show them. Let's see the camera. Show them the camera. Well, th this is one of the first ones like I broke through with. This was, I don't even know the year. So this is the steampunk machine. Now, if you look at this, it's just stuff I found. Some clock parts, some washers, just some random screws. Like I manufacture well, handmade, I wouldn't say manufacture, manufacture is the wrong word to use. This, this isn't mass produced. This is just all basically I quoted as stuff, artistically smashed together in order to make a fully functional tattoo machine. Now, in order to get to that point, I had to learn the basics and that's what Jerry taught me about prefab machine. Like, in the seminar, I'll break it down piece by piece, how to make these pieces, how to set up the geometry, how to run, how to assemble it, and how to run it on a very primitive scale. So when I started building tattoo machines, I had a drill press and a hacksaw and some hand tools and a grinder. I was blessed to have a grinder too. My dad actually for Christmas bought me a little craftsman tabletop drill press and that's uh i still haven't used it to this day i actually have two of them now i actually have four drill presses at this point one's too many thousands never enough there's a lot of different uh <clears throat> there's a lot of different holes in these machines and i always say they're the most simple of tools but the most complex in themselves too um i <sighs> Yeah, we'll go over all that in the seminar. I don't want to get into the technical details, but anyhow, um, just speaking of tools, let's talk tools here. If you're going to be involved in this seminar, apparently you are, if you're spending the time here, um, we need to talk about tools. We need to talk about safety and we need to talk about materials first and foremost. Um, I'm going to start with safety first and foremost, because I've had a lot of injuries due to recklessness and stupidity and laziness. And that is something I absolutely do not recommend. There was a time, well, I'll start with eye protection. When you're working with a drill press, a grinder, you know, a drill press is shooting up little bits and tweets of metal. They're hot. They can get in your eyes and get on your arms. You, you want to wear good clothing, you want to wear gloves, um, you got to be safe with those gloves around a drill press. And 
you want to wear some sort of eye protection. Now I use, I don't know if you've seen lately with COVID, they have those full face shields that drop down. They almost look like welding helmets, but they're clear. Highly recommend that. Or the Googles, goggles, highly recommend goggles. There was a time where I was working on a machine for a client, had to be there in Richmond the next day for a convention. One of his machine done, <clears throat> hurry up. Um, I was grinding something with a die grinder and it shot a shard of metal into my eye. And I ended up, I didn't go to the emergency room. I went to the optometrist and it's a pretty rugged story. She took a magnet and stuck it in my eye, pulled the shard out. And it was almost like a scene out of, um, oh, what's that? One? Uh, I forget the movie. Anyhow, they had my eye cranked open with the, like a speculum. And she, she said, there's gonna be rust in your eye because you were grinding iron in your workshop. We got the iron out, but we need to get the rust out. So she took a little Dremel with a buffer on it. And just like this, imagine your camera is my eye and just went <laughs> right on my eye. Eye protection, you wanna wear it. Trust me on that. It was not fun. I had a headache for a week. It was terrible. Sorry, I'm stressing that, but it's important. Gloves. When you're drilling, you get hot metal shards all over your hands. I have scars all over my fingers. Actually, if you can see my finger here, it's all burned up from this week. You probably can't on the camera. Um, I wasn't wearing gloves. I just hurry up and drilled a hole. A bunch of metal shards shot on my hand. And now I have three nice little burns. Um, <clears throat> more on safety. Um, ventilation is a big thing when you're soldering, when you're welding, um, especially with some of these, these fluxes that are hazardous. You want to have cross ventilation in your workshop. Um, you definitely want fresh air in there. You don't want to be breathing that stuff in. It's toxic. Um, a ventilator is good too, like a face mask. God knows we're all wearing them right now, hopefully. Um, when you're working with iron and steel, it emits uh, particulates of you know, dust, basically iron, and uh, you don't want you don't want to be breathing that into your lungs and your nose. There's been many a day I went home, I was lazy about wearing it, and there's just rust in my nose and dirt, and it'll give you headaches. It'll make you sick. I've burned my lungs using. Um, Patina dyes, which is acid etching. You want to be ventilated and you want to wear respiration, mask, goggles, gloves. Definitely want to wear rubber gloves when you're working with patinas and whatnots too. Um, uh, just to chime in real quick, uh, Sarah in the chat room says, uh, dude, my eyes hurt just knowing about the stories. <laughs> and, uh, I just have to say, you know, it really is kind of the, the goal, right? Is to viscerally understand why we should be using this stuff it's so easy to be like well i don't need it just for this one quick little spurt of whatever but like it's like every time you need to be yeah well, or, it. Gonna, might get hurt yeah yeah there there's been many a time where i just i got lazy and quick and i didn't do things right uh, another thing is is uh <clears throat> When you're working with machines, you're going to need like a vice too. I have vices in my drill presses. I have a vice on my bench. They act as extra hands so you can work on your on your designs, etc. There was there was one time <clears throat> I decided not to. Uh, I, I just needed to drill one hole in a frame, and I was in a hurry again. And I decided to not bolt down the vice to my drill press. And the you know the drill spins, it goes into the machine. Well, the the drill, well, here's a machine here. The the drill, <clears throat> the drill itself bound up and it grabbed the whole machine and spun it. You know, it's like 1500 revolutions per second or something. Well, it grabbed the vice too, and it's a five-pound vice made of steel, and it shot and hit me straight in the breast plate. And that's probably one of the worst hits I ever had. I was black and blue all the way up my side. It knocked me to my knees. That was probably the worst thing and the dumbest thing I ever did. So that being said, 
make sure your vices are locked down, especially on your mills or your drill presses or you're going to get hurt because I did. And I know <laughs> it is not fun. Excuse me. <clears throat> oh, no worries. So uh, uh, John Paul uh, says we have you live on all five big screens in the tattoo studio in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Yo, what's up, guys? That's awesome, man. Beach, too. Oh, I'd love to be at the beach right now. I have to come visit you guys. God bless, man. All right, where were we? We're talking safety. Yeah, so be safe. Um, one of the things I often talked about with Jerry Rieger and his seminars was tooling. <clears throat> you want to have good tools. Like, we can get the job done with the basics, and that, that's what I'm going to teach you. But if you're moving forward and you want to make this something you're going to do all the time, you're serious about this, invest in good tools. Just like your tattoo machines you work with now, your inks, your needles, you want the best. The same thing applies. Tool-wise, I mean, we could go in a bunch of different directions. You want the proper taps, drill bits, um, hand tools, grinders, et cetera, et cetera. It depends how far you want to take this thing, really. So that's something you have to use at your own discretion. Um, personally, my setup isn't in, in some high-grade CNC factory um, in this spotless, sterile environment. I, I, I own a studio in Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania. It's a one-floor studio with a basement underneath. We call it the Dungeon. I've posted pictures of my dungeon all the time. It's just, it's block walls with wood beams and it gets the job done. It's a dirty space for me to work. I ventilated it. I built workshops. Um, but I don't have a giant machine shop. I do everything by hand. It's, it's the way I do it. And this is what I'm trying to teach in this seminar is how to Getting back to what I was talking about in that museum, how to get back to the raw aspect of machine building in the most primitive forms, like just raw and not concerned about pre precision CNC. We can build a machine that runs better than any CNC machine by hand from things we find. Trust me, I do it. And that's what I want to teach you. Um, getting back to that again. The, 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 the Paul Rogers was my favorite um, explanation of prefabricated machines where you build each part assembly, blah, blah, blah. So I think that's a good foundation. That's why I chose that particular machine for the seminar. Um, Zeiss also made a prefab. They were called Bakelites. That's, a, that's another machine that I've, I've um, fabricated, made homage to. And I did that for uh, Skyver as well. Um, actually, here's one here. You guys have probably seen these. These are clear side plates. Back in the day, they were made of Bakelite. But uh, this PVC plastic was more accessible at the time. I thought it had a cool look because it's clear. Zeiss, Zeiss made a uh, <clears throat> the special, which was, a, was which was a clear side plate. And if you look in the Zeiss history books, you'll see you'll see this one. And this is a replica. This isn't an actual Zeiss. So that's a prefab as well. And that's a different style of prefab. It's very primitive, but they all have the basic function, the basic geometry. So that's what we're going to get you to. So I'm going to teach you the basic style using a Rogers prefab. And you'll be able to apply that information to any type of custom build. And then you could just run with it from there. <clears throat> okay. Okay, I've got a, a load of uh, comments here. So uh, Fernando Royball says, I've seen a few Paul Rogers machines at Eric, uh, Eric Inksmith's. Eric has done quite a few tattoos on me. Right. Yeah, they're out there. The Let's real see. deals are out there. And... Uh, you're going to pay a lot of money to purchase one. I will tell you the average price is anywhere. The last one I tried to buy was 5,500 for a prefab and they're getting harder and harder to find. Um, 
when I got into making prefab and I met Mike, it was uh, it was because I couldn't afford one at the time. My first Rogers machine he sold me, um, it was a, a, a Waters Model Six, which was Paul was noted for building on those. Um, but I fell in love with the prefab, just the big, bulky, like raw steel, like hot rod look. And to me, that was the whole that was the whole feeling behind these machines. just like this raw hot rod look, but yeah, I couldn't afford one. So I decided, you know what, let me try and make one. And interesting story. I, I got the plans for my, my first Rogers, my number one, it was a Coleman style J frame. And I photographed it at Mike's, built it to spec, painted it, patina it, it it looked like it, i could fool you with it and i gave it to mike i put it in his hand and as soon as he touched he's like that's a fake like anybody else in the world look at him and be like that that's it um that's not what i'm trying to do here but i wanted to own something similar but five thousand dollars was not in my budget at that point but my mindset was if it was built once I could build it. So that's why I got into it to uh, make myself some cool stuff. Um, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Moving forward. I'm going to move forward here and talk about materials. So I don't keep getting off topic here. I, I have my little list I'm working off of guys. Um, materials. We talked about safety. We talked about tools. We're talking about materials now. Um, in the seminar, I have ingredient sheets. I have layouts for each piece that we're going to be building, uh, what materials I suggest. I can make recommendations on where to look for this stuff. Um, a lot of these pieces and parts, if you have a little bit of ingenuity, you could probably scrape them up from around the house or your workshop or hot rod garage, whatever. Um, a lot of the theory behind machine building, well, not theory, but a lot of the, uh, the componentry behind uh, machine building years ago, because there weren't supply houses, was just things rummaged. Um, I had a conversation with Elizabeth um, last week about parts and pieces and where they were, they were acquired from. So like some of the tube tips were from Model A um, air nozzles back in the day some of the grips were made from douchebag cord i don't know if you guys i don't know if i have one here let's see this one might yeah this one has black on it you know that has this tube is actually an old fountain pen made of brass with a douchebag cord on it and i learned a lot of this stuff from like skyver just working through his museum um but yeah the idea was to just you know fabricate these things from parts so here's another machine instead of a capacitor it just had a little what they call that a uh, rectifier was that Ooh, like a, you want to just back uh, back it up a little bit so the camera can focus on it yeah maybe a little bit more for It's an cool. interesting option there. So yeah, these guys are just rummage stuff. I, I, I did a Lyle Tuttle seminar at Hell City in the 2000s, and he used to tell me they would ride trolley cars in San Francisco, and the advertising up, like when you look up on a bus or a train car, they put those metal inserts with the advertising in it. They had metal banding strips that held them in place, and all the tattoo artists in San Francisco would steal those because it made great spring stock. Kind of like banding around uh, a shipping cart. And banding's not good, but he said the, 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 the temperament of the steel in, in those strips was just divine for um, manufacturing springs. Same with the uh, old one of clocks. So these guys just made parts and pieces out of stuff and that's that's what i'm going to try and teach you too like these pinch vices on these rogers machines where do you see that i'm going to disassemble this real quick this is actually the demo i 
put together this week. <clears throat> this is what holds your tube in place inside of the machine. That's called a pinch, pinch call it. Oops, it just fell. That is actually brake line. You could get stainless tubing, but brake line works just fine. And it braises up divinely. So yeah, materials. I'll tell you where we can find it. I'll tell you what they are. And then we'll work to getting this thing going. <clears throat> and we've been talking about different prefab machine designs. We've already covered a lot of that. There are tons of different machine designs. Like I said, prefab is just where you make your parts beforehand. You assemble it, you tear it back apart, you dial it in, you tweak it. It's it's a process. Um, it, it's going to take the average builder under guidance probably 10 to 12 hours of hard hands-on time. That's That's not the seminar time. Seminar time is information time. Like I'll walk you through a lot of this. Uh, we'll get you dialed in, but it's going to take a lot of time. It takes me 10 hours with raw hand tools to do a prefab. Now, if, if you have a die grinder, if you have a drill press, if you have um, um, tabletop belt sanders, tabletop grinders, we're going to cut down a lot of time. My One of my favorite tools for cutting is a, uh, I think it's a four inch or a five inch Makita cutter, like a uh, cutoff wheel and a die grinder. Y you can knock some of this stuff out quickly. Even better yet, if you have uh, a metal bandsaw, you you'll bang this fast. But the idea behind this is primitive. Um, the idea is simplicity starting with the basics and just getting raw and dirty and working through and putting the work in to see how it was done. I was told, I've never been to Paul Rogers workshop, but I've been told stories that he would just drill these things out, hacksaw them and assemble them. He had bits and parts and pieces everywhere and he would just grab and build. And the, there's all kind of information that I've acquired through the years. But that, that's that's what we're going for here. And that's kind of the style I work in. Okay. I'm gonna get that every oh actually, well uh, your posture. Let's see here. We've got yeah, uh, Paulino quite. says uh, greetings from uh, Sanguine, Texas. Uh, Marcus uh Naftek says uh, hello everyone from uh, Vienna. Nice. Uh, we've Got uh, Paul Blomer says uh, Clockwork Orange. I don't know, maybe he was referring to one of the uh, uh, machines. The we got Mike Ziegler. Oh, Mike Ziegler. Uh, greetings from Bremen, Texas, home of Bluebell Ice Cream. Uh, <laughs> Paul Blomer says greetings from Australia. Uh, yeah, Mike says, uh, Ziggy says, sup, bro. And then uh, uh, Thon Hein says, uh, speaker, answer me. Inbox me when you're free. I'm uh, maybe they're uh, doing some some texting over here. Um, let's see. Right. The, the folks that were in uh, the beach say they take <laughs> guest spots. So, uh, you hear that, Elizabeth? I, uh, I, going to Florida. <laughs> I told them to uh, to shoot you a DM inside of the app, but uh, obviously uh, people can contact. What is a good way to contact you? And as a while well, we're in the middle yeah. here. Yeah, that's on the list too. Okay, all my contact information. First is my email. It's Tony Urbanic, T O N Y U R B A N E K at Comcast.net. Comcast is C O M C A S T. Um, on Instagram, it's just to at Tony Urbanic, same spelling. Facebook is the same, Tony Urbanic. Um, I and don't then, have uh, to, 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 go ahead. I was going to say to, uh, to sign up for the course, it's reinventingthetattoo.com slash build a tattoo machine. <laughs> and then, uh, oops, that's my phone. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> now we can roll model answering the phone. Let's see. Uh, I reference the uh, eye. Oh, 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 yeah, the, it was the eye injury. I guess uh, Paul had uh, a couple people were, yeah. uh, were grimacing and, and uh, <laughs> relating to the to the 
different uh, uh, injuries that people were getting. Oh yeah, uh, I was grimacing too, Paul. I will tell you, man, that was that was an ugly feeling for a few days. It was scary, scary. My eye like pussed closed overnight. It was pretty disgusting. Mm-hmm. So yeah, talking about this course now. So I've set up eight lessons. It, it could run over. It could be more. Um, anybody joins this, they're going to have access to me via Instagram, Facebook, um, email with questions. And if we have to, we'll get into phone conversations or we'll FaceTime to get you through what you need to do. I have no problem with that. Um, I've done seminars for years. I've done them in Richmond, um, Virginia Beach, done them uh, Hell City. I did one near Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, I, I, I love teaching about tattoo machines. It's one of my favorite things to do. So w- when you get into this seminar, we're going to, we're going to do these chapters. I'm going to give you homework before each session. <clears throat> I'm going to have you gather parts and make sure you have the proper tools and that you're ready to roll. Um, and the beauty of this seminar is if you're not ready to roll and you need more time, you can always roll back because you if you buy the seminar, you're going to have access to the whole thing. It's, it's not live, then it's over. It's, it's live, then it's there forever. It could be 100 years from now, hopefully, and that information will still be there for you to access. Is that correct, Gabe? Cool. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and... Uh... There's a, we could click the, the little options so that there's a, people could have discussions. So if they have questions on a particular lesson or a particular video, they could ask them. You'll get the email. And uh, but yeah, absolutely. So it's, um, you know, and, and we'll see if there's a, a lot of interest with the replays. There's no reason why we couldn't get together another live uh, Q&A and uh, critique once a month. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime, man. Anytime. And I know we're going to be doing a machine panel. What is it? Once a month now? That yeah, you, that was amazing. You just let me know the next time uh, we could do it. We'll, uh, you know, if we want to do it on a on a regular monthly basis, then um, I think that would be pretty amazing. Right, right. Okay, so there, if if you go to the website, the uh, reinventingthetattoo.com website, and you go under the seminar information, there are different chapters laid out. Like right now, we're in number one, getting started on the tattoo machine build. Um, we're actually at zero zero because we decided to do this free introductory first to get people's heads wrapped around this just so they understand exactly what they're getting into. Um, there are people that are contacting me about having the parts because I offer the parts if you if you don't have access to tools. And th- th- so the seminar is more like a two part thing with the parts. Um you're probably not going to be into the seminar, the hands-on part till about the third or fourth lesson. I would say more the third, but if, if you want to get dirty, nitty gritty, hands-on grind cut, you better be in it from day one, because I'm going to hit it hard. Um, can you pull that back up? Yay. That breakdown. I just want to run Come over. it. <clears throat> So yeah, it's, it, number one, it, it, this is like the zero zero right now, but the number one would be um, getting started on the machine build. And what that would be is I'm going to have downloadable templates that, that you're going to have to acquire with a recipe for that lesson. Um, for uh, I, When we get off the screen, I'll show you an example. Um, we're going to talk about step-by-step lessons plans for each week. It also, you know, AKA assignments. And again, the materials will be accessible online. You'll be able to email me. Um, we're in the process of setting up a specific Instagram for the machine site. I've dropped the ball on that for years. So I'm going to get that all back up and running. I have hundreds of machines that I built throughout the years that I just that I haven't had time to put up. Technology moves so fast, it's tough for me to keep up with it in life. So we're going to get that moving again for everybody. Um, 
yeah, you, you'll get the homework. I already have homework for the first lesson, but I'm not going to get into that here. If you sign up, you can email me. I'll give you the homework for lesson one. So we can get rolling on lesson one. So you're ready. We can dive right in. Um, I was going to talk about actual machine breakdowns, parts and functions, but I'm going to hold off to the, the first one. Um, you're going to need a basic understanding of what each part is. I have that laid out on uh, blueprint template form, which I will go over with everybody um, during the first lesson. And the, we'll, we'll hit the first thing we're going to do is we're going to we're going to lay out the side plate. And um, I do have different side plate designs. And if you want, I could probably lay out a template where you could design your own as long as you're cutting around the specific hole pattern. And we could work off of that. That's a little complex, but I uh, yeah, possibly will be willing to do that. Um, but I, I recommend maybe just working off of these first. See what else here. Yeah, I do have I do have a kit again with the parts already made. And that kit that kit consists of each piece broken down, and that would be um, the side plate, the base plate, the spring shelf, the A bar, the coil cores, the upper and lower binding posts. And it comes with screws, wing nuts, pinch vise, everything you need everything you need to quote assemble that is not to fabricate that is to assemble the fabrication part is where i stress i mean if you really want to learn machine building i stress you do the fabrication apart it's cool to have the kit because you have the templates already set up but building it from scratch is the most gratifying part in my opinion i built these kits from scratch for everybody that ordered them um, some things I have fabricated, like upper lower binders and A bars, because I, I, I've done a lot of production machines through the years and I have thousands of these things laying around. So the cutoff time, I put those in the kits. But during the seminar, I am going to teach you how to make each part from raw dog material. That is where to get the material, what the sizes of material. Um, the hardness of material, thickness, et cetera, where to drill it. And I have templates for everything. I have everything laid out on paper for you to download again. Um, yeah, so it'll make your life a lot easier. So during, during each uh, lesson, we'll review all this stuff and go over it. So one's like base, base plate and spring shelf construction. Three is a bar discussion, fabrication, collets and two vices. Four is coil construction. We'll build coils. I'll show you how I do it. We can build the cores. We can put it all together. We could, you could show you how to spin it. I could explain the theories, the whys. Um, the binding post contact screws and then I have tons of finishing techniques when we get to that point um, springs what what materials to use how to cut them how to punch them what, what are the best tools um, the best geometry and thicknesses the what's and why's and then it, it, that falls under the last like the tuning trips tricks and techniques which to me is um, that's one of the most important chapters you're going to want to learn. When I teach my seminars, it's mainly focused on um, componentry and tuning. I teach it. I used to teach a uh, four hour seminar with a PowerPoint presentation and it was just around tuning. And these discussions would go on four to six hours with, you know, a group of five, six people breaking down machines, tuning hands on. So, when we get to that point in number eight, that might stretch into two or three more episodes, probably at least one or two, um, depending on who, what, where, when, why, and time. Um, so that's that's what we're going to offer in all this. So it, 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 the seminar is two ninety nine for these this eight series, which will run over without parts. If you're just going to do it raw. And then I believe it's another 150 for the parts, which I'll send and supply. But again, you won't need those for a couple of weeks. 
but I could get them out. I'll get them out as soon as I can. I know that there's one gentleman that emailed me. He's waiting on his parts. You don't need them right now. You'll have them this week. I'm glad you're here, brother. Um, now that I've got the camera on, you want to show off some of those uh, blueprint to paperwork things? Yeah, I'm just going to do a quick because this is public. So I did blueprints of the machine we're building. And each week, I'm going to give you a blueprint and a layout and explanation. Now, these, these blueprints have everything broken down on them, like what parts are, what components are. It shows like the Damn. side plate, all the measurements, thicknesses, widths, drill sizes, et cetera. This is straight up blueprint. I mean, I hand drew these because I'm not very good at CAD. It's just something I should learn. But uh, I like that raw look, man. I like that raw old school feel. So, uh, yeah, I'll show you a couple of things now that I have built. And then if you have any questions, hit me up. Let's see, we got, we got a little bulldog. So scavenge parts, Pennsylvania Railroad. Let me see if I can get some better light on this. Yeah. How's that? There we go. Yeah, with, with the when you tilt it like that, it definitely catches. Oop. Oh, cool. My light quit. Isn't that awesome? All right. Is that better? Yeah, that's cool. A little so back that, a little a little bit back and we're good. Yeah. All right. That was built from a railroad spike that I found walking the tracks actually down the street from my shop. The Pennsylvania Railroad used to come through this neighborhood. So I found this railroad spike and I just I cut it up and fabricated it into a machine. Now, those that you if you recognize this machine, it's a bulldog type style machine. It's fabricated from like five parts and uh, it's called the burn dog. Hmm. And the reason why it was called the burn dog is my dad is a big collector of trains, like Lionel trains and he loves trains and people will, will people would sometimes get funny when you use other people's definitions, hence the name bulldog. There was a little controversy. So I just, spun it a little on the name so it's a bulldog design but it's called the burn dog it's a very compact short machine liner i actually casted those i i, I sold a bunch of them um one of the first micro liners i built was this it's called the micro church this is actually a prefab machine this is actually the prototype but this has like brass and copper inlaid and this was a three-piece um prefabricated frame side plate base plate spring shell same with this this is like a water six but taller roger style machine this is actually made from a uh, spanner wrench and that's a prefab as well it's just a bunch of little pieces i tig welded together again it's a base plate side plate spring shell but it, they all kind of work off the same geometry Another spanner. This was the uh, prototype. It's actually, no, oh, it says on it. Some draft beer spanner wrench. Same thing. Base plate, side plate, spring show. This one's super cool. This is a, they call them church keys. It's for opening beer cans. So I mm. whacked up the, the church key and made it into a side plate. Same deal though. All nice pretty sure. Uh, Chris Wilson was on the uh, chat room says uh, still to this day I run one of Tony's machines the church shader best shader I've owned to date oh I love those church shaders man smooth as butter thanks Chris I'm glad you like it what do we got here uh, okay some of my early machines from this is 2000 2001 same deal I scavenged a piece of angle iron we talked about this in the machine panel so I did a series of like 13 of these, right? I found this long piece of L iron. It was on the railroad tracks and I cut it up and I bent, you can see how wonky that is. I bent the uh, spring shelf over. This frame is one piece out of angle iron. And I did this all by hand with just a drill press 
a hacksaw and a bunch of files. And these took like hours and hours to do. Actually, the first frame I ever cast was based off of one of these. I call it the C frame. You, you guys might recognize this shape. And I casted these in 2001. This was the prototype for it. And quite frankly, I think it was one of the worst machines I've ever made. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. It was a process. It's a process. And then this actually machine I got back and redid years later. This was from 2000. This was a, this is the 10th machine I ever built. So I'm like 2001. Built from scratch, like scratch, scratch. That's that same angle iron from that same bar. You can see these, all these machines came off of that same bar. And I just did the same process over and over. You know, all three of these. Now there, there's 13 out there and I managed to get three of them back. So there's a bunch of guys sitting on these. And yeah, so another thing I wanted to say is you want to get yourself a really, whoa, my light died again. You want to get yourself a really fine ruler. Um, machine style rules. Measure, measurements are highly important <laughs> in this function and process. And yeah, one of the last things I, I, I before uh, signing off here, I want to say is I want to introduce the big daddy. I don't know if any of you guys ever seen this. This is a overscale replica of the J frame. There's a comparison. <laughs> and that was actually made from just pizza and pieces and parts that I acquired. Actually, the, the doorbell or the coils came from a giant old doorbell. And I record them with square cores. And this sucker runs and it's nasty. I built the tube, the oversized tube for it, <laughs> just with stuff I had laying around, some old tubes and pipes and screws. I mean, th this is where I want to get you guys to. If you want to get there, I'm going to get you there. Oh, yeah. <coughs> if you're interested. I have the, uh, I've got the uh, the video uh, fired up here. So whenever you sign off, I could uh, play the play the video we made. OK, that way that way you don't have to do the hard plug yourself. Yeah, go ahead. We're all good. We're all good. So, yeah, sign up at. Uh, www.reinventingthetattoo.com and be sure to check out all the other good stuff and I'd like to thank Gabe Ripley reinventingthetattoo.com and Guy Atchison for uh, bringing me on board and love you guys all hope to see you at the seminar peace cheers what the fuck it's not playing it doesn't like us I say optimize for, well, there we go. How about uh, reinventing the tattoo.com slash build a tattoo machine. And uh, thanks again for tuning in and uh, we'll catch up soon.